Hello everyone, and welcome to another installment of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy on this beautiful uh, spring day. And it is really just, just wonderful out there. It's gorgeous. Uh, I actually took the day off yesterday because it was uh, similarly gorgeous. And uh, I spent some time um, outside uh, in, uh, in a park with, uh, with my family, which was nice. It's just nice to get out there, but remember, it's also important to keep yourself safe. Wear a mask if you're going out anywhere, uh, adhere to social distancing rules, um, and just uh, be careful. Keep yourself safe out there. It's very important. Just because we're in yellow, we could still go back to red at any time if people aren't careful. So keep yourself safe, and uh, we'll, we'll see the, uh, the tail end of this, I'm quite certain. So... We are going to hop back into the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy here. And where we left off, um, Arthur was getting an explanation from Slarty Bartfast, the old man who we ran into earlier, who, about uh, just what Magrathea was and um, about an ancient computer that was programmed to um, calculate the answer to life, the universe, and everything. And um, he's still in the process of watching that uh, particular video. And the computer has found out that the answer to life, the universe, and everything is, in fact, 42. So we'll see what happens uh, after it tells the people of Magrathia what exactly has happened here. Here we go. <clears throat> Chapter 28. It was a long time before anyone spoke. Out of the corner of his eye, Fug could see the sea of tense, expectant faces down in the chair, the square outside. We're going to get lynched, aren't we? He whispered. It was a tough assignment, said Deep Thought mildly. Forty-two, yelled Loon Qual. Is that all you've got to show for seven and a half million years' work? I checked it very thoroughly, said the computer, and that quite definitely is the answer. I think the problem, to be quite honest with you, is that you've never actually known what the question is. But it was the great question! The ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything! Howled Loon Qual. Yes, said Deep Thought with the air of one who suffers fools gladly. But what actually is it? A slow, stupefied silence crept over the men as they stared at the computer and then at each other. Well, you know, it's just... Everything, everything, offered Fu weakly. Exactly, said Deep Thought. So once you do know what the question actually is, you'll know what the answer means. Oh, terrific, muttered Fu, flinging aside his notebook and wiping away a tiny tear. Look, all right, all right, said Loon Qual. Can you please just tell us the question? The ultimate question. Yes! Of life, the universe, and everything. Yes! Deep Thought pondered for a moment. Tricky, he said. But can you do it? cried Loon Qual. Deep Thought pondered this for another long moment. Finally, no, he said firmly. Both men collapsed onto their chairs in despair. But I'll tell you who can, said Deep Thought. They both looked up sharply. Who? Tell us! Arthur began suddenly to feel his apparently non-existent scalp begin to crawl, as he found himself moving slowly but inexorably forward toward the console, but it was only a dramatic zoom on the part of whoever had made the recording, he assumed. I speak of none but the computer who is to come after me, intoned Deep Thought, his voice regaining its accustomed declamatory tones. A computer whose merest operational parameters I am not worthy to calculate. And yet I will design it for you. A computer that can calculate the question to the ultimate answer. A computer of such infinite and subtle complexity that organic life itself shall form part of its operational matrix. And you yourselves shall take on new forms and go down into the computer to navigate its 10 million year program. Yes, I shall design this computer for you and I shall name it also unto you, and it shall be called the Earth. Fu gaped at deep thought. What a dull name, he said, and great incisions appeared down the length of his body. Lung too, suddenly sustained horrific gashes from nowhere. The computer console blotched and cracked, 
The walls flickered and crumbled, and the room crashed upward into its own ceiling. Slarty Bardfast was standing in front of Arthur, holding the two wires. End of the tape, he explained. And that brings us to chapter 29. Zephod, wake up! <sighs> hey, come on, wake up! Just let me stick to what I'm good at, yeah? muttered Zaphod, and rolled away from the voice back to sleep. Do you want me to kick you? said Ford. Would it give you a lot of pleasure? said Zaphod, blearily. No, nor me, so what's the point? Stop bugging me! Zaphod curled himself up. He got a double dose of the gas, said Trillian, looking down at him. Two windpipes. And stop talking, said Zaphod. It's hard enough trying to sleep anyway. What's the matter with the ground? It's all cold and hard. It's gold, said Ford. With an amazingly balletic movement, Zaphod was standing and scanning the horizon, because that was how far the gold ground stretched in every direction, perfectly smooth and solid. It gleamed like... It's impossible to say what it gleamed like, because nothing in the universe gleams in quite the same way that a planet made of solid gold does. Who put all that there? yelled Zaphod, goggle-eyed. Don't get excited, said Ford. It's only a catalog. A who? A catalog, said Trillian. An illusion. How can you say that? cried Zaphod, falling to his hands and knees and staring at the ground. He poked it and prodded it. It was very heavy and very slightly soft. He could mark it with his fingernail. It was very yellow and very shiny, and when he breathed on it, his breath evaporated off it in that very peculiar and special way that breath evaporates off solid gold. Trillian and I came round a while ago, said Ford. We shouted and yelled till somebody came and then carried on shouting and yelling till they got fed up and put us in their planet catalog to keep us busy till they were ready to deal with us. This is all sensitive. Zaphod stared at him bitterly. Ah, shit, he said. You wake me up from my own perfectly good dream to show me somebody else's. He sat down in a huff. What's that series of valleys over there, he said. Hallmark, said Ford. We had a look. We didn't wake you earlier, said Trillian. The lost planet was knee-deep in fish. Fish? Some people like the odd oddest things. And before that, said Ford, we had platinum. A bit dull. We thought you'd like to see this one, though. Seas of light glared at them in one solid blaze wherever they looked. Very pretty, said Zaphod petulantly. In the sky, a huge green catalog number appeared. It flickered and changed, and when they looked around again, so had the land. As with one voice, they all went, Ugh! The sea was purple. The beach they were on was composed of tiny yellow and green pebbles, presumably terribly precious stones. The mountains in the distance seemed soft and undulating, and red peaks. Nearby stood a solid silver beach table with a frilly mauve parasol and silver tassels. In the sky, a huge sign appeared, replacing the catalog number. It said, Whatever your tastes, Magrathea can cater for you. We are not proud. And 500 entirely naked women dropped out of the sky on parachutes. In a moment, the scene vanished and left them in a springtime meadow full of cows. Ow! said Zaphod. My brains! You want to talk about it? said Ford. Yeah, okay, said Zaphod. And all three sat down and ignored the scenes that came and went around them. I figure this, said Zaphod. Whatever happened to my mind, I did it. And I did it in such a way that it wouldn't be detected by the government screening tests. And I wasn't to know anything about it myself. Pretty crazy, right? The other two nodded in agreement. So I reckon, what's so secret that I can't let anybody know I know it? Not the galactic government, not even myself. And the answer is, I don't know. Obviously. But I put a few things together and I can begin to guess. When did I decide to run for president? Shortly after the death of President Uden Branks. You remember Uden Ford? Yeah, said Ford. He was that guy we met when we were kids, the Arcturan captain. He was a gas. He gave us conkers when you bust your way into his mega freighter. Said you were the most amazing kid he'd ever met. What's all this? said Trillian. Ancient history, said Ford. When we were kids together on Betelgeuse, the Arcturan mega freighters used to carry most of the bulky trade between the galactic center and the outlying regions. The Betelgeuse trading scouts used to find the markets and the Arcturans would supply them. There was a lot of trouble with space pirates before they were wiped out in the Dordellus Wars, and the mega freighters had to be equipped with the most fantastic defense shields known to galactic science. They were real brutes of ships, and huge. In orbit around a planet, they would eclipse the sun. One day, young Zaphod here decides to raid one. 
on a trijet scooter designed for stratosphere work. A mere kid. I mean, forget it. It was crazier than a mad monkey. I went along for the ride because I'd got some very safe money on him not doing it, and I didn't want him coming back with fake evidence. So what happens? We get in the trijet, which he had souped up into something totally other, cross three parsecs in a matter of weeks, bust our way onto the mega freighter, I still don't know how, marched onto the bridge waving toy pistols and demanded conkers. A, wildest, a wilder thing I have not known. Lost me a year's pocket money. For what? Conkers! The captain was this really amazing guy, Uden Franks, said Zaphod. He gave us food, booze, stuff from really weird parts of the galaxy. Lots of conkers, of course. We had just the most incredible time. Then he teleported us back into the maximum security wing of the Bale Juice State Prison. He was a cool guy. Went on to become president of the galaxy. Zaphod paused. The scene around them was currently plunged in gloom. Dark mists swirled round them, and elephantine shapes lurked indistinctly in the shadows. The air was occasionally rent with the sounds of illusory beings murdering other illusory beings. Presumably, enough people must have liked this sort of thing to make it a paying proposition. Ford, said Zaphod quietly. Yeah? Just before Uden died, he came to see me. What? You never told me. No. What'd he say? What'd he come to see you about? He told me about the Heart of Gold. It was his idea that I should steal it. His idea? Yeah, said Zaphod. The only po and the only possible way of stealing it was to be at the launching ceremony. Ford gaped at him in astonishment for a moment and then roared with laughter. Are you telling me, he said, that you set yourself up to become president of the galaxy just to steal this ship? That's it, said Zaphod with the sort of grin that would get most people locked away in a room with soft walls. But why, said Ford, what's so important about having it? No, said Zaphod. I think if I'd consciously known what was so important about it and what I would need for it would have showed up on the brain screening test and I would never have passed. I think Uden told me a lot of things that are still locked away. So you think you went and mucked about inside your own brain as a result of Uden talking to you? He was a hell of a talker. Yeah, but Zaphod, old mate, you want to look after yourself, you know? Zaphod shrugged. I mean, don't you have any inkling of the reasons for all this? Asked Forward. Zaphod thought hard about this, and doubts seemed to cross his mind. No, he said at last. I don't seem to be letting myself into any of my secrets. Still, he added on further reflection, I can understand that. I wouldn't trust myself further than I could spit a rat. A moment later, the last planet in the catalog vanished from beneath them, and the solid world resolved itself again. They were sitting in a plush waiting room full of glass-topped tables and design awards. A tall Magrathian man was standing in front of them. The mice will see you now, he said. And that brings us into chapter 30. <clears throat> so there you have it, said Slarty Bartfast, making a feeble and perfunctory attempt to clear away some of the appalling mess of his study. He picked up a piece of paper from the top of a pile, but then couldn't think of anywhere else to put it, so he put it back on top of the original pile, which promptly fell over. Deep thought designed the earth. We built it, and you lived on it. And the Vogons came and destroyed it in five minutes before the program was completed, added Arthur, not unbitterly. Yes, said the old man, pausing to gaze hopelessly round the room. Ten million years of planning and work gone just like that. Ten million years, Earthman, can you conceive of that type of time span? A galactic civilization could grow from a single worm five times over in that time gone. He paused. Oh, well, that's bureaucracy for you, he added. You know, said Arthur thoughtfully, all this explains a lot of things. All through my life, I've had this strange, unaccountable feeling that something was going on in the world, something big, something sinister, and no one would tell me what it was. No, said the old man. That's just perfectly normal paranoia. Everyone in the universe has that. Everyone, said Arthur. Well, if everyone has that, perhaps it means something. Perhaps somewhere outside the universe we know. Maybe. Who cares? Said Slarty Bartfast before Arthur got too excited. Perhaps I'm old and tired, he continued. But I always think the chances of finding out what is really going on are so absurdly remote that the only thing to do is say, hang the sense of it and just keep yourself occupied. Look at me. I designed coastlines. I got an award for Norway. He rummaged around in a pile of debris and pulled out a large plexiglass block with his name on it, and a model of Norway molded into it. 
Where's the sense in that? He said. None that I've been able to make out. I've been doing fjords all my life. For a fleeting moment, they become fashionable, and I get a major award. He turned it over in his hands with a shrug and tossed it care aside carelessly, but not so carelessly that it didn't land on something soft. In this replacement earth we're building, they've given me Africa to do, and of course I'm doing it with all fjords again because I happen to like them, and I'm old-fashioned enough to think that they give, me a, they give a lovely Baroque feel to a continent. And they tell me it's not equatorial enough. Equatorial! He gave a hollow laugh. What does it matter? Science has achieved some wonderful things, of course, but I'd far rather be happy than right any day. And are you? No. That's where it all falls down, of course. Pity, said Arthur with sympathy. It sounded like quite a good lifestyle otherwise. Somewhere on the wall, a small white light flashed. Come, said Slarty Bartfast. You are to meet the mice. Your arrival on the planet has caused considerable excitement. It has already been hailed, so I gather, as the third most improbable event in the history of the universe. What were the first two? Oh, probably just coincidences, said Slarty Bartfast carelessly. He opened the door and stood waiting for Arthur to follow. Arthur glanced down once more and then down at himself, at the sweaty, disheveled clothes he had been laying in the mud in on Thursday morning. I seem to be having tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle, he muttered to himself. I beg your pardon, said the old man mildly. Oh, nothing, said Arthur. Only joking. That brings us into chapter 31. It is, of course, well known that careless talk costs lives, but the full scale of the problem is not always appreciated. For instance, at the very moment that Arthur said, I seem to be having tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle, a freak wormhole opened up in the fabric of the space-time continuum and carried his words far, far back in time across almost infinite reaches of space to a distant galaxy where strange and warlike beings were poised on the brink of frightful interstellar battle. The two opposing leaders were meeting for the last time. A dreadful silence fell across the conference table as the commander of the Valergs, resplendent in his black jeweled battle shorts, gazed levelly at the Gagugvunt leader, squatting opposite him in a cloud of green, sweet-smelling steam and with a million sleek and horribly beweaponed star cruisers poised to unleash electric death at his single word of command, challenged the vile creature to take back what it had said about his mother. The creature stirred in his sickly broiling vapor, and at that very moment the words, I seem to be having tremendous difficulty with my lifestyle, drifted across the conference table. Unfortunately, in the Valerg tongue, this was the most dreadful insult imaginable and there was nothing for it but to wage terrible war for centuries. Eventually, of course, after their galaxy had been decimated over a few thousand years, it was realized that the whole thing had been a ghastly mistake, and so the two opposing battle fleets settled their few remaining differences in order to launch a joint attack on our own galaxy, now positively identified as the source of the offending remark. For thousands more years, the mighty ships tore across the empty wastes of space, and finally dived screaming onto the first planet they came across, which happened to be the Earth where, due to a terrible miscalculation of scale, the entire battle fleet was accidentally swallowed by a small dog. Those who study the complex interplay of cause and effect in the history of the universe say that this sort of thing is going on all the time, but we are powerless to prevent it. It's just life, they say. A short air car trip brought Arthur and the old Magrathean to a doorway. They left the car and went through the door into a waiting room full of glass top tables and plexiglass awards. Almost immediately, a light flashed above the door on the other side of the room, and they entered. Arthur, you're safe, a voice cried. Am I? said Arthur, rather startled. Oh, good. The lighting was rather subdued, and it took him a moment or so to see Ford, Trillian, and Zaphod sitting around a large table, beautifully decked out with exotic dishes, strange sweetmeats, and bizarre fruits. They were stuffing their faces. What happened to you? demanded Arthur. Well, said Zaphod, attacking a bone full of grilled muscle, our guests have been gassing us and zapping our minds and being generally weird and have now given us a rather nice meal to make it up to us. Here, he said, hoiking out a lump of evil-smelling meat from a bowl. Have some vegan rhino's cutlet. It's delicious if you happen to like that sort of thing. Hosts, said Arthur. What hosts? I don't see any... A small voice said, Welcome to lunch, Earth creature. Arthur glanced around and suddenly yelped. Ugh, he said. There are mice on the table. There was an awkward silence as everyone looked pointedly at Arthur. 
He was busy staring at two white mice sitting in what looked like whiskey glasses on the table. He heard the silence and glanced around at everyone. Oh, he said with sudden realization. Oh, I'm sorry. I wasn't quite prepared for... Let me introduce you, said Trillian. Arthur, this is Benji Mouse. Hi, said one of the mice. His whiskers stroked in what must have been a touch-sensitive panel on the inside of the whiskey glass-like affair, and it moved forward slightly. And this is Frankie Mouse, the other mouse said, pleased to meet you, and did likewise. Arthur gaped. But aren't they... Yes, said Trillian. They are the mice I brought with me from Earth. She looked him in the eye, and Arthur thought he detected the tiniest resigned shrug. Could you pass me that bowl of grated Arcturan mega donkey? she said. Slarty Bartfast coughed politely. Uh, excuse me? Yes, thank you, Slarty Bartfast, said Benji Mouse sharply. You may go. What? Oh, uh, very well, said the old man, slightly taken aback. I'll just go and get on with some of my fjords, then. Ah, oh, well, in fact, it won't be necessary, said Frankie Mouse. It looks very much as if we won't be needing the new earth any longer. He swiveled his pink little eyes. Not now that we have found a native of the planet who was there seconds before it was destroyed. What? cried Slarty Bartfast, aghast. You can't mean that. I've got a thousand glaciers poised and ready to roll over Africa. Well, perhaps you can take a quick skiing holiday before you dismantle them, said Frankie acidly. Skiing holiday, cried the old man. Those glaciers are works of art. Elegantly sculpted contours, soaring pinnacles of ice, deep, majestic ravines. It would be a sacrilege to go skiing on high art. Thank you, Slatibart Fast, said Benji firmly. That will be all. Yes, sir, said the old man coldly. Thank you very much. Well, goodbye, Earthman, he said to Arthur. Hope the lifestyle comes together. With a brief nod to the rest of the company, he turned and walked sadly out of the room. Arthur stared after him, not knowing what to say. Now, said Benji Mouse, to business. Ford and Zaphod clinked their glasses together. To business, they said. I beg your pardon, said Benji. Ford looked round. Sorry, I thought you were proposing a toast, he said. The two mice scuttled impatiently around in their glass transports. Finally, they composed themselves and Benji moved forward to address Arthur. Now, Earth Creature, he said, the situation we have in effect is this. We have, as you know, been more or less running your planet for the last 10 million years in order to find this wretched thing called the question to the ultimate answer. Why, said Arthur sharply. No, we already thought of that one, said Frankie, interrupting, but it doesn't fit the answer. Why, 42, you see, it doesn't work. No, said Arthur. I mean, why have you been doing it? Oh, I see, said Frankie. Well, eventually just habit, I think, to be brutally honest. And this is more or less the point. We're sick to the teeth with the whole thing, and the prospect of doing it all over again on account of those winnet ridden bogons frankly gives me the screaming heebie-jeebies, you know what I mean? It was by the merest lucky chance that Benji and I finished our particular job and left the planet early for a quick holiday, and have since manipulated our way back to Magrathia by the good offices of your friends. Magrathia is a gateway back to our own dimension, put in Benji. Since then, continued his murine colleague, we've had an offer of a quite enormously fat contract to do the 5D chat show and lecture circuit back in our own dimensional neck of the woods, and we're very much inclined to take it. I would, wouldn't you, Ford? said Zaphod promptingly. Oh yes, said Ford. Jump at it like a shot. Arthur glanced at them, wondering what all this was leading up to. But we've got to have product, you see said Frankie. I mean, ideally, we still need the question to the ultimate answer in some form or other. Zaphod leaned forward to Arthur. You see, he said, if they're just sitting there in the studio looking very relaxed and, you know, just mentioning that they happen to know the answer to life, the universe, and everything, and then eventually have to admit that it's 42, then the show's probably quite short. No follow-up, you see. We have to have something that sounds good, said Benji. Something that sounds good, exclaimed Arthur. A question to the ultimate answer that sounds good, from a couple of mice. The mice bristled. Well, I mean, yes, idealism, yes, the dignity of pure research, yes, the pursuit of truth in all its forms, but there comes a point, I'm afraid, where you begin to suspect if there's any real truth. It's that the entire multidimensional infinity of the universe is almost certainly being run by a bunch of maniacs. 
And if it comes to a choice between spending yet another 10 million years finding that out, and on the other hand, just taking the money and running, then I, for one, could do with the exercise, said Frankie. But, started Arthur, hopelessly. Hey, will you get this, Earthman? interrupted Zaphod. You were a last-generation product of that computer matrix, right? And you were there right up to the moment your planet got the finger, yeah? Uh, so your brain was an organic part of the penultimate configuration of the computer program, said Ford. Rather lucidly, he thought. Right? said Zaphod. Well, said Arthur doubtfully, he wasn't aware of ever having felt an organic part of anything. He had always seen this as one of his problems. In other words, said Benji, steering his curious little vehicle right over to Arthur, there's a good chance that the structure of the question is encoded in the structure of your brain, so we want to buy it off you. What the question? said Arthur. Yes, said Ford and Trillian. For lots of money, said Zaphod. No, no, said Frankie. It's the brain we want to buy. What? Well, who would miss it? inquired Benji. I thought you said you could just read his brain electronically, protested Ford. Oh, yes, said Frankie. But we'd have to get it out first. It's got to be prepared. Treated, said Benji. Diced. Thank you, shouted Arthur, tipping up in his chair and bank backing away from the table in horror. It could always be replaced, said Benji reasonably, if you think it's important. Yes, an electronic brain, said Frankie. A simple one would suffice. A simple one, wailed Arthur. Yeah, said Zaphod with a sudden evil grin. You just have to program it to say what, and I don't understand, and where's the T? Who'd know the difference? What? said Arthur, backing away still farther. See what I mean? said Zaphod, and howled with pain because of something the Trillian did at that moment. I noticed the difference, said Arthur. No, you wouldn't, said Frankie Mouse. You'd be programmed not to. Ford made for the door. Look, I'm sorry, mice old lads, he said. I don't think we've got a deal. I rather think we are, we have to have a deal, said the mice in chorus, and all the charm vanishing from their piping little voices in an instant. With a tiny whining shriek, their two glass transports lifted themselves off the table and swung through the air toward Arthur, who stumbled farther backward into a blind corner, utterly unable to cope or think of anything. Trillian grabbed him desperately by the arm and tried to drag him toward the door, which Ford and Zaphod were struggling to open, but Arthur was dead weight. He seemed hypnotized by the airborne rodents sw swooping toward him. She screamed at him, but he just gaped. With one more yank, Ford and Zaphod got the door open. On the other side of it was a small pack of rather ugly men who they could only assume were the heavy mob of Magrathea. Not only were they ugly themselves, but the medical equipment they carried with them was also far from pretty. They charged. So, Arthur was about to have his head cut open. Trillian was unable to help him, and Ford and Zaphod were about to be set upon by several thugs a great deal heavier and more sharply armed than they were. All in all, it was extremely fortunate that at that moment, every alarm on the planet burst into an ear-splitting din. And that brings us to chapter 32. Emergency! Emergency! flared the klaxons throughout Magrathea. Hostile ship has landed on planet! Armed intruders in Section 8A! Defense stations! Defense stations! The two mice sniffed irritably round the fragments of their glass transports where they lay shattered on the floor. Damnation! muttered Frankie Mouse. All that fuss over two pounds of earthling brain. He scuttled round and about, his pink eyes flashing, his fine white coat bristling with static. The only thing we can do now, said Benji, crouching and stroking his whiskers in thought, is to try and fake a question, invent one that will sound plausible. Difficult, said Frankie. He thought, how about what's yellow and dangerous? Benji considered this for a moment. No, no good, he said. I not fit the answer. They sank into silence for a few seconds. All right, said Benji. What do you get if you multiply six by seven? No, no, too literal, too factual, said Frankie. Wouldn't sustain the punter's interest. Again, they thought. Then Frankie said, Here's a thought. How many roads must a man walk down? Ah, said Benji. Ah, uh -huh, now that does sound promising. He rolled the phrase around a little. Yes, that's excellent. Sounds very significant without actually tying you down to meaning anything at all. How many roads must a man walk down? Forty-two! Excellent! Excellent! That'll fox em. Frankie, baby, we are made! They performed a scampering dance in their excitement. 
Near them on the floor lay several rather ugly men who had been hit about the head with some heavy design awards. Half a mile away, four figures pounded up the corridor looking for a way out. They emerged into a wide open plan computer bay. They glanced about wildly. Which way do you reckon, Zaphod? said Ford. At a wild guess, I'd say down here, said Zaphod, running off down to the right between the computer bank and the wall. As the others started after him, he was brought up short by a kilozap energy bolt that cracked through the air inches in front of him and, a sm and fried a small section of adjacent wall. A voice on a bullhorn said, Okay, Beeble Brox, hold it right there, we've got you covered! Cops! hissed Zaphod and spun around in a crouch. You want to try and guess it all, Ford? Okay, this way, said Ford, and the four of them ran down a gangway between two computer banks. At the end of the gangway appeared a heavily armored and spacesuited figure, waving a vicious kilozap gun. We don't want to shoot you, Beeble Brox! shouted the figure. Suits me fine, shouted Zaphod back, and dived down a wide gap between two data process units. The others swerved in behind him. There are two of them, said Trillian. We cornered. They squeezed themselves down in an angle between a large computer data bank and the wall. They held their breath and waited. Suddenly, the air exploded with energy bolts as both the cops opened fire on them simultaneously. Hey, they're shooting at us, said Arthur, crouching in a tight ball. I thought they said they didn't want to do that. Yeah, I thought they said that, agreed Ford. Zabod stuck a head up for a dangerous moment. Hey, he said, I thought you said you didn't want to shoot us, and ducked again. They waited. After a moment, a voice replied, It isn't easy being a cop. What did he say? whispered Ford in astonishment. He said it isn't easy being a cop. Well, surely that's his problem, isn't it? I'd have thought so. Ford shouted out, Hey, listen, I think we've got enough problems of our own having you shooting at us, so if you can avoid laying your problems on us as well, I think we'd all find it easier to cope. Another pause and then the bullhorn again. Now see here, guy, said the voice. You're not dealing with any dumb, two-bit, trigger-pumping morons with low hairlines, little piggy eyes, and no conversation. We're a couple of intelligent, caring guys that you'd probably quite like if you met us socially. I don't go around gratuitously shooting people and then bragging about it afterward in seedy Space Rangers bars like some cops I can mention. I go around shooting people gratuitously, and then I agonize about it afterward for hours to my girlfriend. And I write novels, chimed in the other cop. Though I haven't had any of them published yet, so I better warn you, I'm in a mean mood. Ford's eyes popped halfway out of their sockets. Who are these guys? He said. Dunno, said Zaphod. I think I prefer to when they were shooting at us. So are you going to come quietly? Shouted one of the cops again. Or are, we gonna, are you going to let us blast you out? Which would you prefer? Shouted Ford. A millisecond later, the air about them started to fry again as bolt after bolt of Kilozap hurled itself into the computer bank in front of them. The fusillade continued for several seconds at unbearable intensity. When it stopped, there were a few seconds of near quietness as the echoes died away. You still there? called one of the cops. Yes, they called back. We didn't enjoy doing that at all, shouted the other cop. We could tell, shouted Ford. Now listen to this, Beeble Brox, and you better listen good. Why? shouted back Zaphod. Because, shouted the cop, it's going to be very intelligent and quite interesting and humane. Now, either you all give yourselves up now and let us beat you up a bit, though not very much because, of course, we are firmly opposed to needless violence, or we blow up this entire planet and possibly one or two others we noticed on our way out here. But that's crazy, cried Trillian. You wouldn't do that. Oh, yes, we would, shouted the cop. Wouldn't we? He asked the other one. Oh, yes, we'd have to, no question, the other one called back. But why? demanded Trillian. Because there are some things you have to do even if you are an enlightened liberal cop who knows all about sensitivity and everything. I just don't believe these guys, muttered Ford, shaking his head. One cop shouted to the other, Shall we shoot them again for a bit? Yeah, why not? They let fly another electric barrage. The heat and noise was quite fantastic. Slowly, the computer bank was beginning to disintegrate. The front had almost all melted away, and thick rivulets of molten metal were winding their way back toward where they were squatting. They huddled farther back and waited for the end. And that brings us into chapter 33. We only have uh, about five pages left of this, so I'm just going to go ahead and finish it up. <clears throat> chapter 33. But the end never came. 
at least not then. Quite suddenly, the barrage stopped, and the sudden silence afterward was punctuated by a couple of strangled gurgles and thuds. The four stared at each other. What happened? said Arthur. They stopped, said Zaphod with a shrug. Why? Dunno. Do you want to go and ask him? No. They waited. Hello? called out Ford. No answer. That's odd. Perhaps it's a trap. They have the wit. What were those thuds? Dunno. They waited for a few more seconds. Right, said Ford. I'm going to have a look. He glanced around at the others. Is no one going to say, no, you can't possibly let me go instead? They all shook their heads. Oh, well, he said, and stood up. For a moment, nothing happened. Then after a second or so, nothing continued to happen. Ford peered through the thick smoke which was billowing out of the burning computer. Cautiously, he stepped out into the open. Still, nothing happened. Twenty yards away, he could dimly see through the smoke the space-suited figure of one of the cops. He was lying in a crumpled heap on the ground. Twenty yards in the other direction lay the second man. No one else was anywhere to be seen. This struck Ford as being extremely odd. Slowly, nervously, he walked toward the first one. The body lay reassuringly still as he approached it, and continued to lie reassuringly still as he reached it and put his foot down on the Killazap gun that still dangled from its limp fingers. He reached down and picked it up, meeting no resistance. The cop was quite clearly dead. A quick exam examination revealed him to be from Blagulon Kappa. He was a methane-breathing life form, dependent on his spacesuit for survival in the thin oxygen atmosphere of Magrathea. The tiny life support system computer on his backpack appeared unexpectedly to have blown up. Ford poked around it in considerable astonishment. These miniature suit computers usually had the full backup of the main computer back on the ship, with which they were directly linked through the Sabitha. Such a system was fail-safe in all circumstances other than total feedback malfunction, which was unheard of. He hurried over to the prone figure and discovered that exactly the same impossible thing had happened to him, presumably simultaneously. He called the others over to look. They came, shared his astonishment, but not his curiosity. Let's get shot at this hole, said Zaphod. If whatever I'm supposed to be looking for is here, I don't want it. He grabbed the second Killazap gun, blasted a perfectly harmless accounting computer, and rushed out into the corridor, followed by the others. He very nearly blasted hell out of the air car that stood waiting for them a few yards away. The air car was empty, but Arthur recognized it as belonging to Slarty Bartfast. It had a note from him pinned to part of its sparse control panel. The note had an arrow drawn on it, pointing at one of the controls. It said, this is probably the best button to press. And that takes us to chapter 34. The air car rocketed them at speeds in excess of R-17 through the steel tunnels that led out onto the appalling surface of the planet, which was now in the grip of yet another drear morning twilight. Ghastly gray light congealed on the land. R is a velocity measure defined as a reasonable speed of travel that is consistent with health, mental well-being, and not being more than, say, five minutes late. It is therefore clearly an almost infinitely variable figure according to circumstances, since the first two factors vary with not only with speed taken as an absolute, but also with awareness of the third factor. Unless handled with tranquility, this equation can result in considerable stress, ulcers, and even death. R17 is not a fixed velocity, but it is clearly far too fast. The air car flung itself through the air at R17 and above, deposited them next to the heart of gold, which stood starkly on the frozen ground like a bleached bone, and then precipitately hurried itself back in the direction whence it had come, presumably on important business of its own. Shivering, the four of them stood and looked at the ship. Beside it stood another one. It was the Blagulon Kappa police craft, a bulbous shark-like affair, slate green in color and smothered with black stenciled letters of varying degrees of size and unfriendliness. The letters informed anyone who cared to read them as to where the ship was from, what section of the police it was assigned to, and where the power feed should be connected. It seemed somehow unnaturally dark and silent, even for a ship whose two-man crew was at that moment lying asphyxiated in a smoke-filled chamber several miles beneath the ground. It is one of those curious things that is impossible to explain or define, but one can sense when a ship is completely dead. Ford could sense it and found it most mysterious. 
a ship and two policemen seemed to have gone spontaneously dead. In his experience, the universe simply didn't work like that. The other three could sense it too, but they could sense the bitter cold even more, and hurried back into the heart of gold, suffering an from an acute attack of no curiosity. Ford stayed and went to examine the Blagulon ship. As he walked, he nearly tripped over an inert steel figure lying down in the cold dust. Marvin, he exclaimed, what are you doing? Don't feel you have to take any notice of me, please, came a muffled drone. But how are you, metal man, said Ford. Very depressed. What's up? I don't know, said Marvin. I've never been there. Why, said Ford, squatting down beside him and shivering, are you lying face down in the dust? It's a very effective way of being wretched, said Marvin. Don't pretend you want to talk to me. I know you hate me. No, I don't. Yes, you do. Everybody does. It's part of the shape of the universe. I only have to talk to somebody and they begin to hate me. Even robots hate me. If you ignore me, I expect I shall probably go away. He jacked himself up on his feet and stood resolutely facing the opposite direction. That ship hated me, he said dejectedly, indicating the police craft. That ship, said Ford in sudden excitement. What happened to it, do you know? It hated me because I talked to it. You talked to it? exclaimed Ford. What do you mean you talked to it? Simple. I got very bored and depressed, so I went and plugged myself into its external computer feed. I talked to the computer at great length and explained my view of the universe to it, said Marvin. And what happened? pressed Ford. It committed suicide, said Marvin, and stalked off back to the heart of gold. Which brings us to chapter 35, which is the last chapter in the book. That night... As the Heart of Gold was busy putting on a few light years between itself and the Horsehead Nebula, Zaphod lounged under the small palm tree on the bridge, trying to bang his brain into shape with massive pangalactic gargle blasters. Ford and Trillian sat in a corner discussing life and matters arising from it, and Arthur took to his bed to flip through Ford's copy of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Since he was going to have to live in the place, he reasoned, he'd better start finding out something about it. He came across this entry. It says... The history of every major galactic civilization tends to pass through three distinct and recognizable phases, those of survival, inquiry, and sophistication, otherwise known as the how, why, and where phases. For instance, the first phase is characterized by the question, how can we eat? The second by the question, why do we eat? And the third by the question, where shall we have lunch? He got no further before the ship's intercom buzzed into life. Hey, Earthman, you hungry, kid? said Zaphod's voice. Uh, well, yes, a little peckish, I suppose, said Arthur. Okay, baby, hold tight, said Zaphod. We'll take in a quick bite at the restaurant at the end of the universe. And there we have it. That is the end of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Rather an abrupt ending, I know, but uh, it continues into uh, four other books in the series. So, uh... If you enjoyed this and feel so inclined to seek out the rest of them, I would highly recommend them. They are just wonderfully written, uh, brilliant in their complexity, both as science fiction and as comedy works, and they're just wonderfully amazing. So the, uh, the other books in the series, if you are curious, are um, The Restaurant at the End of the Universe is the second one, Life, the Universe, and Everything, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish, and Mostly Harmless. And, uh, yeah, there we go. We finished yet another one. I'm thinking that um, I'll probably be taking a few days off while I decide what the next thing I want to read here is. So um, if you are watching this on the Brentwood page and have any suggestions as to what you might want to uh, hear me read next, that would be wonderful. But um, I'm thinking it's probably going to be um, The Fellowship of the Ring by J.R.R. Tolkien. So uh, we can start another series, and we can get you all interested in that. Hmm. All right, then. I will see you next time, which will be, uh, like I said, probably a few days from now. So until then, everybody stay safe. Enjoy the great weather. Stay healthy. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. We'll see you next time.